speaker. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. So you guys, uh, man, I've been out of school for 13 years, and uh, it's different. You guys are way more mature than I was. Got barcodes to scan into. <laughs> I was a terrible student, um, absolutely awful. But um, my background is I love money, so I was gonna find it one way or the other. Um, I could tell you that I guess from a college perspective, I would say I didn't find much use out of my college career. Sorry to anybody here at college, but I do want to say I didn't even graduate. Went to Penn State, didn't graduate. But I would say if you don't get your college career under wraps, you're probably fighting the odds. So you're actually just playing a, a poker hand your whole life, right? And it's how do I accumulate money? How do I accumulate as fast as I can? And how do I do it from a perspective of, you know, not stacking the odds against me? So I stack the odds against myself a little bit, not knowing it. I'd say my drive and my focus is kind of what overcame that at the time. So I'll go all the way back to where I was once upon a time in your seat, probably cheating on a test and showing up hungover, and that was me. But um, I got really focused in college during a, uh, I used to, I used to work for a college painting company. Do you guys still have those around where you like, they come and recruit you for a college yeah. to run your own like organization? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? What, or what do they still have left? What do they have around? What are their company names? College Pro, Cert Pro, to College Works. Yeah, man, I remember that. So I was with a different company, um, but you know, they said, hey, make 10 grand in a summer. I was like, whoa. That's big money for a college kid. So I was, so that got me real focused real fast. And I wanted a car uh, between those two things. I didn't realize I was going to learn how to run a business. So I jumped in there and it's, it's, it's probably the best experience that changed my life looking back on it to do it. It's hard. Uh, you could lose money, but you will learn at a very early age how to make money in this game. So I learned how I kind of cut my teeth uh, working with an entrepreneur at the time during that time for a few summers, worked my way up and said, hey, I can make a lot more money faster if I leave school now. So I did like 14 credits short of graduating. My mom hates me to this day for it. Doesn't hate me, but she's upset about it. So um, I came out of school though, and I, I was doing this and, and learning how to make money. And then I read the book, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Do you guys read that? Anybody read that? In your spare time. Yeah, you read it? Yeah. It's a good one, okay? It's good. It's, I'm not, don't go home, don't read anything you don't want to read. If you got an audio book, you're walking to class. It's one to kind of shift your mind a little bit as to how money works, right? Because most of the time, most people, most people come out of school, you're going to go apply for a job, you're going to put Temple on your resume, and what's going to happen is you're going to work yourself into the grind for the next 20 years. And at some point, you're going to be like, man, I was in this real estate uh, trio group, and they really had kind of a leg up on the average person. How do I get back into that? So you guys have the opportunity now, having speakers like myself come in and say, hey, you can start now. So I started my real estate career young. I was probably... 22, 23, I read that book and I read what, you know what wholesaling is? Yeah, what is it? It's just where you buy properties and sell it for more. Kind of, kind of uh, close, really close. Sell the contracts. Sell the contracts, right. yeah, so you assign contracts, that's close. So um, I didn't have a real estate license and I didn't, all I knew about real estate at the time was what my parents told me was, you know, we just bought a house and some realtor showed me a house and nothing wrong with being a realtor, but that, that wasn't investing, so. I read in, in Rich Dad Poor Dad, there was an excerpt in there about um, Robert Kiyosaki bought a, you know, put a property under contract to buy, sold it in Arizona for like 40 grand in like a day, right? And I was like, 40 grand? I was like, that's as much as some people make coming out of school in one day. Whether it's true or not, whether he actually did that, I don't know, but it got my wheels turning. And I looked into it and I was like, oh, wholesaling, this makes sense. Logistically, it's easy. Um, a lot of the things in real estate investing are easy actually the logistics are easy the implementation is what's hard so we looked at I looked at it and said oh wholesaling did a little bit of research had to figure it out found a property put it under contract for my first assignment deal was like a thousand dollars or so I didn't care I had to get it done my dad said it's not possible you can't do it I was like I have to get this done so I went ahead and assigned a contract which means you actually put a property under contract you actually don't buy it you don't own the property you assign the rights of the contract to an end buyer who's then going to buy it for the difference of price so you have somebody you might buy a property put a property under contract um, so I'm buying Justin's house for thirty thousand dollars I'm going to do an agreement to sale with him which means I have the right to now buy his house in say 30 days I also know that I have say Jeremy on the back end that wants to buy it for 40 grand and so what I do is I then assign there's a clause in the, in the contract that says it has the right to assign the contract to Jeremy He's the actual one that's closing. The spread between 30 grand and 40 grand is what I keep. 
Well, at the time I was coming out of school, I was 22, 23, and I'm like, whoa, you can make 10 grand, 20 grand, 50 grand on a deal. I'm in. So I was in uh, Burlington City, New Jersey is where I was like wholesaling some properties. I'd done maybe five or 10, made like 100 grand pretty quick. And, uh, but I outgrew it and I said, I'm gonna, uh, what's my next biggest market? Philadelphia. Drove down to Philadelphia, uh, saw those. You guys ever see those We Buy Homes to Fix signs? Yeah, yeah. Okay, those are just independent investors trying to get you to call them. It's just a lead generation. Well, I called one, just trying to feel out the market, see what it's about. Ended up calling a guy, saying, hey, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I'm wholesaling properties. I said, oh, well, I'm wholesaling properties. You wanna meet at a diner? See what's up? I said, sure. So we sat down, chatted. You know, our wavelengths met pretty well. And then within an hour, I said, you wanna be partners? He said, okay. So all of a sudden that steamrolled into, we buy homes to fix and we sell homes to fix. A company we started in Philadelphia, probably back in 08 when the world was crashing and everything was ending is when we were jumping into the real estate market. And um, at that time we became the largest wholesaling company in the Philadelphia market. And it was exciting, it was crazy. It's where I really learned how to build and own a business because it's a business you're running. Um, and I would say after a certain period of time, it's kind of crazy that business. You can make a ton of money on a deal, but at the end of the day, you might have three months worth of no closings that turn into $100,000 after three months. But during those, that three month period, you have salary, you have payroll, you have marketing expenses, and all of a sudden your burn rate is say 30 grand a month that you're spending. So by the time you come back to that 100 grand, you could easily be at 10 grand. You know, so it's, and then all of a sudden 100 grand comes in, do you take a paycheck, what do you do? It gets pretty volatile wholesaling at times, at least when I have built it. There's guys now in the city that I'm friends with that are significantly more advanced at wholesaling than I ever was. But at that time we were the, the largest in the game. So, and this will come back around. So what I didn't realize I was doing at the time was doing two things. One, I got in the game when the market was at a low, 2008, which is really important. The world was ending, the only people buying, there were no more banks handing out money to people that didn't deserve to have properties. It was cash buyers, whales sitting in the sidelines, coming in and buying property. That's a big difference in learning how to, I can't assign a property to a guy worth $60 million. He's not gonna pay me a penny more than that's worth because that man knows this market better than I do. Where people were getting away with it in 2006, 2007, your average person comes out of college, or not out of college, your parents' retirement, they're like, what am I gonna do with this money? And they're gonna take their $150,000 in their IRA, they're gonna have a realtor find them a house, they're not gonna know their market, they're gonna overpay for the property, they're gonna lose value. And if somebody assigning a property at that time could have made a bigger spread in 2007. They couldn't get away with that in 2008, 2009. So when I stepped in, my average wholesale fee was maybe like five, seven thousand dollars at a clip, which in today's market is a lot less. We're at the top of a cycle, love it, hate it, we're at the top of a cycle. So wholesalers now are making, I know guys making 20 to 50 grand on every deal. It's crazy, it's way bigger than I ever made um, at that time. But what I was learning was the whales that were sitting on the sign that have been making money for uh, multiple cycles in a row have survived crashes, have survived the 90s, 2000, 2008. They're here for a reason, they stayed. Most people get wiped out during a cycle crash. They stayed and taught me really how to underwrite a deal. So that'll come to fruition as to where I am today in a minute. But um, so, in, so as the volatility, backing up back to 2010, maybe 2009, as the volatility of wholesaling, as I was learning to build a business came to be, I said, man, we got to, I said to my partner at the time, I said, hey, we've got to stabilize cash flow. I said, it's crazy. I said, hundred grand in, you know, you have a family of kids. I didn't have kids at the time, but it's, it's tough to like, to predict where your next paycheck was going to come from. Now it could make really good bonus money, but we needed something to stabilize it. So I said, I want to try property management and property management is the redheaded stepchild of real estate. Nobody wants to deal with it, right? Nobody. It's, it's. It's tough, right? Nobody, everybody wants to put their money in, and not have to deal with tenant complaining about the leaky toilet, or the, or, or and I got stories for, I got stories I can't even tell on camera about things that I've experienced over the years. You know, from, I had a guy one time threatened to kidnap me. I've had drug houses. I've had, we've had people come with guns. We, had, it's crazy. Um, you manage enough properties, you see some stuff, and it's tough, but you make a ton of money doing it. So we jumped into um, property management, send out some mailers. Remember, it came back at the time. Some guy said, hey, yeah, let's, uh, I want you to manage my property. He had no idea what I was doing, but it didn't seem very hard, right? You just figure it out as you go. One thing led to another. That took over our um, time, honestly, and we built that up to maybe six or 700 properties in the Philadelphia area that we were managing, and I was approached then by um, a company called TCS Management. I don't know if anybody, do you guys know, you know TCS, obviously. Uh, everybody's nodding their head, really? Cool. TCS is, uh, so I, the, the owner, Ben Aller, um, had, 
I had been at the time trying to acquire other properties to grow as a management company. And Ben said, Hey, I want to buy you. And I said, I'm not really in the, you know, we're trying to grow. We're not trying to be bought. And then he, he was persistent and said, no, I want to buy your company. I want to buy your company. I said, all right, let's have a dinner. And he goes, you know, my family's worth, um, you know, we control $2 billion in real estate assets. I was like, all right, whatever. I was like, this, uh, I thought he was putting me on. So he goes, no, no, Google me. And I was like, okay. So I Googled him and I was like, okay. I was like, let's put a price tag on this and let's do this deal. So it didn't take much time. He was the real deal. And um, they, so an hour later after meeting Ben at a bar, I, he goes, you want me to buy your company? I said, yep, sounds good. So an hour later we have a deal and uh, we sold Atlas to TCS management. I then retained small partnership in it. And um, to this day, I mean, that's my, that's my crew. That's my circle, that's my family, yeah. So just a quick question about that. So is that like gold dollar? The so Gold Dollar is uh, Ben's father. So okay. Gold Dollar is owned by Richard Dollar, um, Ben's family. And they actually, I mean, Richard was debatably the pioneer of all of HOA management in the country. He, he built up uh, back in the 80s a organization that was, it was like 400,000 units they managed across the country at one time, then helped merge it public with um, First Service. So he is a pioneer in the industry. Now they took all that money, rolled it into buying properties, and now they own like 30,000 units across the country. They're huge. They have like 700 employees and it's a massive organization. So yes, yes in essence, but Ben is second generation and he said, I want to do it again. That's what he wanted to do. And he ended up, one of the big steps was buying uh, Atlas. So I have a lot of experience in the property management field, not by necessarily choice. I have a lot of good experiences, uh, a lot of experience from it. Um, but going back to the underwriting, so when we sold our company, I had two silent partners in Atlas in Maryland that I've been friends with for years, and they helped us transition our company. They were doing hard money lending. So um, I, we had done a few loans up here and so forth, and I said, um, well, now what do I do? The company's sold, you know, I've got, I'm still partners with them, but it was different, my role was changing. And they, um, they said, uh, I said, let's deploy some capital up here. I said, so, but I said, this is why it would work is because I learned back in the day to how to underwrite, how to look at a good deal based on my uh, wholesaling. So it came all back to wholesaling. I could tell you what a good deal was because I knew my market based on wholesaling so many transactions. So therefore, when I lend you money, so hard money, you guys know what hard money is? Yeah, so hard money is different than a bank, right? A bank, goes, you go to a bank, you say, I want to buy a house, 45 days, they want your credit score, they want your DNA, they want all this other fun stuff. Um, and they're really underwriting you as the borrower. Hard money, true hard money, is underwriting the asset. So meaning I have to know when I'm looking at a good deal and when I'm looking at a bad deal. If I'm looking at a bad deal and I put, even if you're a good borrower and I put money against that, that is super high risk, again, in what we do. So I was able to tell what a good deal was by being able to, uh, uh, wholesale deals back in the day 10 years ago I didn't know this is how it was gonna work now I can see I know when I'm looking at a good deal based on my uh, my experience wholesaling so my partner said alright let's deploy some capital made sense I understood how to underwrite which is not good could you just uh, uh, underline some of the key things that uh, would characterize a good deal in that field? so everybody wants to know what a good deal is there's there's different exit strategies so, um, so you're either flipping, you're buying and holding, everything else is just fancy stuff. You're somewhere in between, like subject to and all that stuff people talk about, don't get into that. There's, it's much easier to make money either flipping or renting, one or the other. Um, renting, I could just tell you like, you know, there's a certain feel to it now at this point that I have with, di with different deals. The, the thing that you, the skill set you really want to develop right away is, um, let me keep going actually, I'll get back to that, yeah. So, uh, we went ahead and we started underwriting. Now we do a lot, a lot of transactions in the Philadelphia market. It's what I do. It's what pays my bills. Um, but I would say the two strongest things I've learned, all the stuff you guys are learning here and all the stuff that you learn moving into the real estate world are really going to be useless without the ability to market. You have to learn how to market. It's crazy because you're in the Fox school business and in a real estate classroom, but I'm telling you, you have to learn how to market. And this doesn't mean go to a marketing class. This means you have to learn how to market locally. This isn't marketing for Coca-Cola. This isn't marketing at the Super Bowl halftime show. This is marketing in your local geographic market if you're gonna do it at this level. If you wanna do it at a national level, I'm not your speaker. Locally, I am. So what you have to understand is you have to get a lead flow that then, because you can learn how to assign a contract, you can learn how to flip a house. That, those logistics are easy to learn. You learn in a few months. What you don't, what people don't understand is that you have to have lead flow. Lead flow is generated by marketing. So 
marketing to me is really in essence everything I do. It's why why Jeremy's here filming this. It's why everything everywhere I go, there's always a social presence. If you look us up on social media, we're everywhere. Go friend me on Facebook. Go go look at that. I mean, it's my Facebook account has nothing to do with my social life. You know, I guess it does because I run a business. So what I running a business and having a social life really are the same thing. I mean, you do your business is your life, but like what you're gonna find typically is gonna be. You need to you need to utilize how to get in front of your local market. So I knew I had people that needed loans. So I backed my way into where do I get people that need loans? Realtors, investors. How do I get in front of those people? How do I do it locally? I don't, I'm not going to take out fifty thousand dollar commercials on a weekly basis to do this. It's not a good use of my time. How do you do it on on uh, a skinny budget? I've done that for my entire career. So we're actually all in the business of marketing. You just don't know it. Um, or maybe you do know it, but the sooner you grab that, grasp that, the better it is. And all the big players in our market now, all the big flippers, all the big uh, landlords, all of them have lead sources. And they, and lead sources can be sheriff sales. You guys go right down. Have you, anybody here been to the sheriff sale before? Probably. Yeah, you've been down there. Yeah, it's, it's a zoo. It's crazy. Um, the Philadelphia one especially is, is crazy compared to the other surrounding counties. But um, that's like a lead source. That's all it is. It's not, It's not. I have to go to sheriff's sale to get my deals. Some people get stuck on a specific lead source and say, this is my only deal. This is my only um, lead source. The problem is when that dries up, you don't realize that your business starts to dry up. So you really wanna have multiple lead sources at any given time operating, whether it's mailers, uh, investor-friendly realtor working with you, Share sales, whatever it is, you want to have multiple avenues because from time to time they shift and they move and you have to be able to adapt to it from a marketing perspective. So the majority of my day right now is spent with marketing. That's it. Just figuring out marketing, making sure things are tweaked. So once you guys get this stuff down in terms of, I and mean, I'll go into what a good deal looks like and, and what I do and what the skill sets are that you need, um, you're really going to be focused on how do I get in front of my local market and stay there. And the one thing that I'd say, not the one thing, one of the bigger things that we have over probably any other hard money lender in the area is I have more lead flow. When I have more lead flow, I have more deals to choose from. When I have more deals to choose from, I can do safer deals. I can take the deals that really make sense to us. When you're trying to squeeze blood from a stone, it's a risky position in a business to be in because you're going to risk money whether you want to say it or not because you want to pay a bill put money on the street, deal goes bad, you know, it's 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 not a good look. So being that we're all in the business of marketing, to answer your question on what a good deal is, I would say you've got to learn your market um, is the first thing. So each market will have a different variation of a good deal. There's some, um, some good rules to live by in terms of some good guidelines as in, so if you're trying to rent a property, we have a couple of things that we look at. We want to make sure that we can always liquidate a property in the event of um, a downturn and how much downturn do you expect? I mean, you had 40% downturn in 2008. That's a ton. You can't really liquidate even at the numbers that we work at. You could, uh, couldn't do it in 2008. Um, so we like to buy at like 70% ARV. That's where I like to be all in. ARV, you guys familiar with that term? No, ARV is after repair value, meaning the value that it would be fixed up to. So I like my all in number, closing costs, construction, everything to be about 70% or less, preferably less. I don't want to go above that. So when you say, oh, the, the, this property's on the market, it's 90% value, this is a great deal. No, it's not. And most people are going to tell you it is, it's not. Um, you know, we get we buy most of our houses probably 30 cents on the dollar, 25 cents on the dollar, the stuff that we get now. Like, that's the real number. And if you're not in that world, you're, you're risking money if you actually buy something. Go ahead. What are your main sources of lead generation? Now, um, we get a lot from, via social media. Um, mm. I mean, now I would say it comes from everywhere. There's a certain point when all your marketing goes out there that there's like a snowball effect where you don't even know where half of it's coming from. I should track it better probably, I'm just lazy. Um, but I would say social media does a lot. Social media is powerful. It's a little bit of white noise in our industry right now. Five years ago when I first started really doing videos every day and so forth, like I was one of the only guys doing it. So it was new to everybody and like there was this guy doing it. Now it's like I feel in our industry, everybody does uh, videos. So I don't know what the next thing is. You always want to stay ahead of that. Social media is huge. Um, the millennials, you guys at some point, not yet, but in the next 20 years, you will be the house buyers. You will be the wealthy people that have to be appealed to and you guys don't pick up newspapers and read them right i mean you're on your phones period and i get it that's the way you get messages right now we're in a transitional phase where you still have baby boomers your parents your parents uh parents will still have a lot of the wealth and they get a lot of their news through fox news or radio or or, or somewhere in between right you have a lot of like baby of that generation like stepped into facebook and make funny posts for us to all laugh at right so um so, so the way people receive information right now, I would say I would do a lot of online and offline marketing. So between networking, uh, real estate networking groups, 
Uh, mailers are, are still true, meaning mail, mailing campaigns you mail out to certain targeted lists of people um, hold true. Social media is big. Um, what else? We have di di people that dial out outbound to other people. I'm trying to think what else we do. We have some print ads, Craigslist, that kind of stuff. Go ahead. What kind of real estate groups are you part of? Uh, so when I first came on to to push the money under the streets for hard money, I was in every group in the area. There wasn't a group you couldn't find me at. And then I narrowed that down to the ones that I really find are currently, that I still go to like on a monthly basis. So there's a lot of ones besides the ones I'll name here. But um, the ones that I really find that have the most value are DIG, Diversified Investment Group. Yeah, they're huge. Um, GP Rea is pretty good. GPRIA, R-E-I-A, R-I-A. Um, SJI, which is South Jersey, just right across the bridge, they're another big one. South Jersey Real Estate Investment Group. Um, These are on Facebook. I think, that, yeah, I'm pretty sure they all have Facebook accounts. These are the ones that I physically will go to, though. Yeah. Um, so they're good networking groups. There's, you're going to find players of all kinds there. You're going to find people that have no idea what they're doing to somebody you're going to bump into that is worth more money than God. You just don't know uh, at these groups. So treat them all the same. You go, you learn. Uh, know who you listen to in this business. Know who you listen to. There's some people that can really lend you down, lead you down. There's no regulations in this business, truly, really, right? They're not like... It's not like a stock market where you have the SEC coming in and telling you, you know, auditing all your files. It's fairly an unregulated world in real estate investing. So therefore, it leads to people coming in that can lead you astray pretty quickly. So know who you're listening to. Do your own due diligence with that stuff. So, but those are the groups that I typically go to. Yeah. You mentioned kind of you got to be a little careful with who you uh, listen to. Listen to. What would you say is kind of a red, uh, what do you call it? red, red flag? Red flag. Man, there's been some guys that I've listened to that I'm like, if the wrong, if they talk to the wrong person, they're never gonna know. Or you know, if they talk to somebody who doesn't know what they're talking to, they're never gonna know. Uh, honestly, when you so when you're around the networking scene enough, like when you're around that scene, certain names will continually come up in different lights that um, you kind of just get to know. Kind of catch on. So. You kind of catch on. That's that's honestly it. Um, you know, I, I would, yeah, that would be honestly the way I would say it. It's hard to vet yourself when you're new. When, I, when, you, when you've when you been in the game and then, like, you talk to somebody, you can tell instantly. But when you don't know, you've got to kind of figure that out. So I would say when you're around it enough, you'll know who's a player, who's not, who's probably somebody you should stay away with, who's not. Um, trust your instincts, too, you know. If you're like, hey, this sounds like a lie. Or this guy, you know, this guy or girl seems really sleazy. Probably right. You know, why are you thinking that? So it's, it's typically what you'll find at the highest level uh, of real estate is a lot of integrity. You'll find people have, so um, the lowest levels, people think, oh, you're gonna steal my deal. I can't give you that address. You're gonna do this. You, you don't know what you're doing. The highest level are you make a phone call, you agree on a price and that's a done deal. The contract is just a formality. So the integrity level of the bigger players is very high. And when, so if you see something shady that happens, that is probably somebody that is not truly you don't want to do business with. The higher you go in the game, the, the level of integrity, because the reputation of that person is more important to them than any contract, than anything. Because their reputation is, you know, like you said Richard Al earlier, he'll defend his reputation to the death because, but he knows in one phone call, this is the person, you know, if you want to recommend this, you go to this guy. That's who that is. And he built that over years, 20, 30 years. So that's extremely important to have. Uh, integrity is an important one to learn. But other than that, you got to kind of see your way through it. There's no shortcut on that. Um, going back to what you asked me about a good deal, you know, from a rent from a rent perspective, I would say you want to operate at about 50% of um, principal and interest is a good number. 45, 50% is where you want your numbers to be. Meaning, if my principal and interest on my 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 mortgage on a house that I'm buying for rent is say $400 and my rent is $800, that's probably a decent deal. And you're like, well, what if it's 700? You know, what if I'm at 600 and the rent's 800? You're gonna lose money. You're gonna lose money because it's good until what happens is a heater goes out, an eviction happens. You know, so you got somebody's out of the house, three months carrying costs, et cetera, et cetera. That $200 a month you were accumulating is now $2,400 over a year is now half a roof, half a heater, whatever it is, gone like that. So you you think you're operating at $400 a month positive cash flow with principal and interest at 400, but you're really operating at probably 50 or $100 a month. So um, 45 to 50%, 70% um, ARV is a good number. Flipping, uh, from finding a good flip deal, 
That's learning how to comp. So do you guys know what comps are? Like comparables, you ever hear that term? It's the most important skill in this business. If you don't know how to comp, you're risking money every time you try to take a deal. We're in the business, we're not in the business of making money, we're in the business of protecting money first, making money second. Everybody has to realize that because you can only lose 100% of your money one time, right? So what happens is when you, to learn to comp, unfortunately there's no shortcut there. I'm always in, that's, that's I'm in trend every day. Um, that's our local MLS system. I am in it every day and I've seen thousands and thousands of trend, you know, deals and I'm looking, I mean, the, this, the technology now is so good in terms of, you know, you pull up a map and I can see everything it's sold for, how much it went for, all the details, public record, everything. Cannot use those free sites out there. They can give you a little bit of an idea if you guys want to feel it out. But the only reason I carry a real estate license is because uh, I need access to my MLS. That's it. It's that important to me. Um, so learning to comp is, you know, when you're inside the city, I'm typically one tenth of a mile or less when I'm looking to buy a property. I like to be on the block. There's certain areas, you know, right here around Temple, people always go, oh, it's a Temple property. Uh, go three blocks in the wrong direction. You want to tell me there's students even close to there? No, no chance. People will try to sell you that. People will try to tell you it's Temple. It's not Temple. You got to know when you're on the block, when you're not. Um, brewery Town right now. You guys familiar with Brewery Town? Yeah. Yeah, Brewery Town's crazy. It's crazy. But it's crazy in two ways. One, because if it doesn't continue to expand in the way that um, the market it's expanding now, if it gets cut short in the next cycle, you'll watch it implode because it's not fully transitioned. So meaning right now you're having this, um, right now this is like the fish town of 10 years ago where you have, people are picking up properties for like 20 or 30 grand and reselling them at like quarter million, $300,000. It's nuts. But you're, you're, you'll drive a block and you'll be like, I can't live here. How's their house selling for three hundred, four thousand dollars $400,000? It's because it's transitioning and they're pumping a lot of money into it. So those are really, the people that play the outskirts of those transitioning markets or the cowboys of the market, they're go, they're go big or go home. Um, I mean, when I, what's that? I was say high risk, high reward. Big time, big time. And honestly, they don't survive. Majority of them don't survive into the next cycle. I watched it last cycle. I watched Francisville transition. I remember one of the guys that out built uh, Francisville. Uh, so for every one of him, I have 20 people I know back in 2008, 2009 that are no longer anywhere near the business because they got smashed. So my, my strong advice would be don't dabble in a transitioning market because stay with markets that are very consistent that probably aren't going to turn into your crazy boom next, next cycle. Um, but also aren't gonna, gonna go down a lot next cycle. Like stay in like bread and butter neighborhoods that um, don't have a lot of fluctuation. Those are good areas to get deals. So, but comping inside the city, I'm one tenth of a mile. I wanna see um, what cash sales are. I wanna see resale values. When I'm outside the city, you know, you're inside the suburbs and so forth, you're really looking in that neighborhood. So if you have like a property in a neighborhood, the property half a mile away, two miles away, that's not a comp. So you need to really be as tight as you can, and the more sales, the better. The less date, the less properties showing, um, like uh, days on market, we call it. Meaning, there's less days on market, the better. So you want to see areas that are moving, properties are moving consistently. There's not a ton of in inventory. Uh, basic supply and demand kind of shows that, right? So if you have a hundred houses sitting, and you're like, oh, this one house sold, but you have a hundred other houses of sitting there as competition. It's gonna take a while to get yours sold and you better hope yours is the nicest one of those hundred houses. It's just supply and demand. And the only answer to that is people are gonna start dropping price and now prices come down. You're not making as much money as you anticipated. Yeah.